Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, let's start with Michael Gove's leadership campaign and take a look at some of the newspaper front pages, all of them covering the revelations about Michael Gove taking cocaine. Gove, the cocaine hypocrite, must quit. That's in the Daily Mirror. The Daily Mail. Gove, I fight on undaunted. The Guardian. Gove's bid for number 10 on the brink after drugs admission. And the Times, Gove pleads for second chance over cocaine use. So the question to all of you is, is Michael Gove's leadership campaign sunk? I, I don't think it is sunk. I think he's a very credible candidate. He's very good on policy. He's very articulate, a great debater. He obviously has to answer questions about uh, this business with cocaine use 20 years ago. Well, he's answered them. Um, well, I think he's a very viable and credible candidate. Ash? I don't think anyone cares about the cocaine use itself. Really, I think what they care about is the hypocrisy. So when he was education secretary, he uh, introduced measures which meant that teachers would be banned from the profession if they had a history of drug use. So why is it that there's one rule for him and another for everyone else? I think just to be clear, he didn't introduce those laws, but certainly they were in place by the time mm -hmm. he was education secretary. But but levelling obviously of hypocrisy. And, and he was and he was in favour of them. And at the time he was um, uh, meant to be using cocaine, he was writing editorials saying that um, you know cocaine was. A, corrosive to society it was immoral to take it and I think what um, his revelations what Rory Stewart has said about smoking opium led some about uh, smoking cannabis what this shows is that there is actually a common sense consensus that there is such a thing as safe recreational drug use in moderation that you shouldn't criminalize everyone who takes small amounts of drugs for personal use. Well and use. there may be a debate about decriminalizing um, drug use uh, during this campaign. Zoe in terms of Michael Gove here and now and his campaign is it over? Is it on the brink? I, I actually think it is, and it's a shame, because I, I've actually long quite liked Gove. I think he's actually quite a nice guy, and I think he's smart. But I think he, people don't like him, or, or it doesn't take much to make uh, people not like him. I mean, other candidates, including Boris Johnson, have come out with very similar um, admissions, and it hasn't. It's just fall, it's like water off a duck's back. So I think this will probably be the end of, of Gove. But I think there is something a little bit embarrassing about the whole thing that's kind of... It's almost actually playgroundy, kind of, oh, well, I took drugs too, I did... You know, it's emba it's mm. just a bit sort of embarrassing. I think it's also interesting to think about why we are so draconian in our views about drugs. And I personally can't stand drugs, apart from alcohol, which I like. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, I, I think this idea that it, it's a sort of the ultimate taboo which can fell a career, I mean, there's something quite wrong-headed about that. Right. I mean, I suppose it is about lawmakers not being lawbreakers, Phil. Is it over for Michael Gove? doubt it. I mean, it's become a sort of auction to say uh, how many drugs everyone's taken, hasn't it? And mm. most of them, I don't believe them. I think they're <laughs> admitting to things they haven't done. Um, I doubt it's over for Michael Gove, but the two immediate constituencies, of course, are Conservative MPs, and as I understand it, as yet, none have yet uh, reneged on their support for Michael Gove. But whether the Conservative members will see this in the same well, liberal light that we are, mm. if he gets that far. I don't know. Quasi will know better than I do, but I'm not sure. So I think it might damage his campaign. All right, well, let's talk to George Eustace, Conservative MP, who is backing Michael Gove. And I presume you're still backing Michael Gove, George. Yes, absolutely. I worked with Michael Gove in the Department for the Environment. I know that he can get things done. Uh, I think that he can unite our party and actually get Brexit uh, delivered. And uh, he's got a formidable intellect and he's the right candidate to lead us right. at this very difficult time. Right, um, and difficult time for Michael Gove personally because it splashed all the drug revelations across all the papers as we have just shown, not the headlines you would have wanted. I want to ask you specifically about one of the questions he was asked uh, by Andrew Marr yesterday and this was about his ESTA form, the visa form for entering the United States. We now know from your campaign team that he's taken legal advice, Michael Gove, from a QC who is satisfied he completed his visa forms to the states correctly. Why did he need legal advice from a QC? It's a straightforward yes or no answer on that form. Well, uh, look, I don't. Uh, he probably couldn't even recall what was on the form and um, a, a question was asked and so he sought clarity. He's got the answer from a QC, which is um, he legally filled out that form in the right way. But like, for right, me... Well, hang, on, hang on, let's just have a look. Let's just have a look at the question because it is very straightforward. Uh, we can show our viewers and our guests in case they've forgotten or not filled in an ESTA form. Um, the ESTA eligibility question, have you ever violated any law related to possessing, using or distributing 
illegal drugs. So presumably, Michael Gove answered yes to that question. Look, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know what he, uh, how he answered that. You don't have to that. be a lawyer. You just, uh, I mean, it did he, he or didn't he? He said uh, he did take cocaine. He's well, look, he's discussed it uh, with a lawyer. He's had satisfactory legal advice. But uh, coming back to the broader point, uh, I worked for David Cameron, obviously, during the 2005 election. Uh, you will recall there was a huge storm then about whether he took drugs. Uh, it dogged the campaign. It's what the media got very obsessed with from the beginning to the end of that campaign. It didn't stop uh, Conservative Party members judging that he was the right leader for our party, mm. nor did it stop members doing exactly the same. So I think you have to distinguish between what's obviously been a media storm in the Sunday papers in the usual way uh, from actually what matters in this leadership contest which sure. is who we should are, have as prime minister. And those are two, two different things as you say um, but can you just answer for us did he say yes to that question about violating any law relating to possessing using or distributing illegal drugs? Uh, I don't know the answer to that but I know that he um, and he's had legal advice that he uh, complied with the law and what he did was legal. All right let's talk about levels of hypocrisy. Um, Ash Sarkar in the studio here raised that issue. Is it more about the fact that he does at least support a law even if he didn't introduce it that teachers be barred from teaching if they have taken class A drugs? So it's okay to become Prime Minister if you've done that but not to be a teacher? Hmm. Well, you can become a teacher if you took drugs in your youth before you became a teacher. So those offences in that, and this was introduced by the Labour Party, but admittedly wasn't changed uh, when, uh, when Michael Gove uh, was there. So it was just a continuity of uh, things that had already been in place for some time. Um, but it's not a bar on anybody teaching if they'd had, uh, for instance, a you know, student experience where they had taken cannabis or taken uh, any other drug. So, uh, no, it's exactly the same. And I think you know, David Cameron had a, a very clear line on this, which is people are entitled to a private pass. You can judge MPs once they enter public life on what they do while they're in public life. But we should, uh, in this leadership contest, be deciding who's right to be our Prime Minister now, uh, not saying that the only criteria is you have an entirely unblemished record for your entire life. I mean, as a leading Brexiteer yourself, why don't you just throw your weight behind Boris Johnson? Well, I think uh, there's a very real danger uh, that if you uh, go headlong for a uh, no-deal uh, Brexit, as Boris Johnson has suggested. I think there is a danger that we precipitate an early general election. In that general election, the Conservative Party will get shredded because the Brexit Party will stand against us. And we face the prospect of Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister before Christmas. I think there's a very real danger of that. And that is why I actually believe it is worth getting a serious Prime Minister in place who can unite our party, uh, reach an agreement with the DUP, uh, get the European Union back to the table, and have one more go at seeing if we can get a sensible agreement in place. And I think Michael Gove is best placed to navigate that difficult task. Was there anything that put you off supporting Boris Johnson? You've talked about no deal. Was there anything else? Uh, look, I like Boris Johnson. Uh, I've uh, worked with him uh, for a number of years. Uh, I have nothing against him personally. Uh, it's just for me and you know, all of the candidates uh, in this election are colleagues and I would support and work whoever got elected. But for me, uh, we have to choose one candidate who we believe is right. And for me, that's Michael Gove uh, because he's got the ability to grasp detail, uh, to, right. to cope with complex situations uh, and a true proven track record in delivery. Right. Um, thank you very much, um, George Eustace. Uh, let's talk to Kwasi Kwarteng sure. about Boris Johnson. I'm going to talk to you first and then we'll open up the discussion uh, for everybody else. Should historic drug use disqualify people from higher office? You said you don't think he should drop out now, but in principle, should it? No, I don't think it should. Right. I think that uh, indiscretions uh, in the past 25, 30 years ago should not disqualify people from public office. Right. But do people need to be straight and honest about their past? I think they should. And also, I think there is an issue uh, with having double standards. I think that if you are uh, someone who in, pu in public life is trying to maintain high standards against drug use or whatever it is, uh, it's quite natural for people to look at your record and say, well, hang on a sec, you do one thing, but you're saying another. I think that's legitimate. I don't think that's necessarily the case with Michael who I think is a strong candidate, but there is an right. issue. But you think he it. has displayed double standards? No, I, I, I said, I deliberately said he, I don't think he has done. I think he's been very frank about uh, his, his... But surely drugs. over the over the example um, of education and teachers, there is a double standard Well, there. he didn't set the policy. I mean, George well, was quite no, right. No, but he, he supported the, the policy. He didn't set the policy. He was Secretary of State. And also what he did refers to a period before he was in, in politics. All right, well, let's have a look at Boris Johnson then, if you are saying that there are no double standards. He's a former Mayor of London, a former Foreign Secretary and a potential Prime Minister. Did Boris Johnson snort cocaine? Because it's not clear from the different answers he's given over the years.
I don't think he did. I mean, he, I'm the wrong person to ask. Well, you are representing um, the Boris yes, Johnson campaign, and you obviously will absolutely. want to know in the same way that George did. Yeah, and did I've known him for a long time, but I do not know every single party that he went to uh, between the ages of 18 and 35 sure. or whatever it was. So I can't guarantee to you now what he, he did do. My understanding is that he didn't. Right. Uh, he said that he didn't. But do you but think that, it's... But I, I can't guarantee uh, what he was doing. But do you think it's clear? Because the issue was first put to Boris Johnson in a 2005 episode of Have I Got News For You, where he replied that he had tried unsuccessfully to snort cocaine while at university, but sneezed instead. In fact, he said, I may have been doing icing sugar. But then with an interview, in an interview, I should say with Piers Morgan for GQ magazine in 2007 he says I tried it cocaine at university and I remember it vividly it achieved no pharmacological psychotropic or any other effect on me whatsoever um, and then later on in an interview with the Marie Claire magazine in 2008 he's interviewed by Janet Street Porter and asked about drugs and jokey comments um, she said you said in interviews you snorted coke well that was when I was 19 Boris Johnson says it all goes to show that sometimes it's better not to say anything. Then asked when he's running in that campaign for Mayor of London, he said it was simply untrue that he had taken cocaine, adding that he'd been offered a white substance, none of it went up my nose. Why did he say he had taken it when he then says it's simply so untrue? So my understanding is that he hadn't, he hasn't, he's never taken cocaine. That's my understanding. Obviously, you'd have to ask him directly whether he And have you talked to him about this? Are you clear and happy and satisfied? I'm satisfied that he's the best candidate because he's the best campaigner who's someone who can connect with the electorate and connect with voters. Yes. That's why I'm backing him. As far as his drug use or not, uh, that's completely irrelevant to me. And you're right. We do need to ask him, why isn't he doing any broadcast interviews? Why hasn't he agreed to the debate? So we can ask so him. So the main uh, reason why, he ran in 2016 and everyone said that it was completely shambolic. I was part of that campaign and he pulled out. 2019, he's showing incredible discipline. The team is a very, very good well, He's one. showing discipline because he's now, not talking to anybody. Now people are complaining. Now people are complaining. There'll be plenty of time to debate these issues if and when he gets into the second round uh, with, the, with the members. We'll have four weeks of debate. All these things could be aired at length what? Uh, when and if we get to that point. Well, let me open it out. What do people think of the fact that he has remained silent up until now, certainly in, in broadcast interviews anyway? I mean, I think what he's been trying to do is manage his image. The Boris Johnson, which most of the public knows, is a snake oil salesman and a bit of a blusterer. And I think he's hoping that by uh, restricting interview access at this early stage, it can do something to, you know, kind of clean up his image, make him look a bit more uh, professional and statesmanlike while the early candidates take each other out. That's what he's hoping for. I, I think Boris is a snake oil salesman who hasn't got any snake oil. And uh, the, this period of silence on his behalf, I hope it stretches into years, so I rather welcome it. Because when he has broken his vow of silence, he said things which are wholly fantastical, such as we will leave on the 31st of October, come what may. He doesn't have the numbers, and yet he says it. He then says we'll withhold the payments that were due mm. to the European Union, even though that's bound to go into court mm. and would and would prevent her, him fulfilling the I mean, first I'd promise. To, I'd hate to sort of uh, disrupt the disunity, but Phil Collins, I remember, I read your articles every week. I think you're no, a great you columnist. Sure. But I remember ahead of the 2017 general election, you said that Labour were facing their worst defeat since 1931. Yes. And you were completely wrong about that. And as a I don't constituent, think I was, actually. you were completely no, no, wrong. No, no, I know. I said, no, I don't you think said, so. and I've got it here actually. The Labour Party needs to brace itself for its worst result since Ramsay Macdonald split the party in 1931, and that was complete nonsense. You were well, completely wrong about that. And if you had the humility to, to, to say, this, to admit that well, you were wrong, no, it's very relevant because people like you make predictions all the time. All right, well, what's and wrong? And you've been falsified no, all right, well, what, in the last right, three years well, again let, and again. Let, and and as a constituent of mine said yesterday, forgive me, speak. No, I know you're getting a bit riled, but it's. It's true. You said something yeah, that was Quasi, completely you've got false. to let him answer. And um, a constituent of mine said to me, to, why he? do you listen to these people? Why do we listen to these people? They get things wrong. Or are all you the time. blustering in order to well, not, resist answering specific. difficult questions I'm on behalf of Boris specific. Johnson? Quasi, that's, um, Phil. that's a really silly point. It's not a silly because point. Because it, it would answer. be very easy, wouldn't it, for me to produce a whole series of other points where I was right, but it would be pathetic because none of those will be relevant to the future either. So it's a really very silly point. The question is not what Boris Johnson desires, but whether it is possible. What we 
need to hear from him, and this is why he does need to break his silence, we need to hear how his plan is feasible, given that if he wants to take Britain out of the European Union without a deal, the votes are not there in the House of Commons so, for it. So you've made a prediction. Why am no, I not a prediction? Hang question, quite no, are there, are the the votes, but First of all, are there votes in the House? So, At the moment as it stands, Amber Rudd, your senior Conservative colleague, has said equally that plan will never get through Parliament. So the reason why we had an extension, let's get back to the facts. The but just answer got, that question. Is, are the numbers the reason, there, Quasi? They may not be there, but the right. reason why we, we didn't leave on the 29th of March was because the Prime Minister wrote a letter to Donald Tusk which asked for an extension. Now, what is very clear to me is that if Boris Johnson is the Prime Minister, he will not be uh, uh, writing a letter to Donald Tusk asking for ex an extension. Would he prorogue Parliament? The 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 basis, would he prorogue Parliament? I don't think he would, but that's the, basis on which, that's the basis on which the extension happened. Right. The Prime Minister, you still haven't answered my question Minister, about the numbers. You said they may, but you said they may not be there. And that is important, isn't it? If you are standing on a platform, as Boris Johnson and mm. others are, saying that actually we will go for no deal if we haven't managed to agree something that is palatable to Parliament and to the government, um, and the numbers aren't there, then you will have a general But I'm election. making a very specific point about how the extension happened. The extension happened not because yeah. Parliament voted for it. The but, but, extension but happened quasi, well, that because the Prime Minister, vote. Phil, but no, the but Prime Minister... Sorry, yeah, we, we understand. We understand the, the, the point. Prime Minister we do. wrote the letter. No, we, we understand the yeah, point. And you've made it. The Prime Minister we, doesn't write the letter, then we come out. I know. We got it first uh, time. Uh, wait, we got I, it first I, time. I, I, would I you disagree to, with that? No, I hate to jump in here, but sure. um, as a voter and a citizen of this country who's very interested in what the future of this country is going to be, mm. like, I want to ask you a very simple question, which is how is no deal going to happen if Boris Johnson isn't going to prorogue Parliament, if there aren't the numbers in Parliament to support a no deal, which is what we've seen uh, earlier this summer? Simply, how are you going to do it? So that's without it either going to a general election or a second referendum. So that's what I've tried to say uh, about three times, and Phil got the uh, point, he claims. So well, the, and the, po the point was, you. the reason why we got the extension was because the Prime Minister, Theresa May, wrote to Donald Tusk asking for an extension. But that's what happened. But okay. you're answering that's a what happened. question. You are. And, uh, and, uh, no, about the all right, and I'm, I'm saying a that's about the you, no, you Ash, about no deal Ash, Ash and Quasi, don't talk over each other because we want but to I'm hear what you've both got to say. You are, but you are, you are cutting across everybody else. So just allow people to finish and then everyone can hear. And let's try and stick to the substance and not make it so personal. Um, in terms of character flaws, Zoe, are these the issues on which this leadership election is going to continue to be fought? I mean, I think that is just kind of how politics is now. And I think our, our kind of interest in and patience and ability to sort of stick with slightly more extended arguments, ideas is sort of limited. And I think just interestingly to go back to the original point about drugs and Boris Johnson and, and hypocrisy, which Ash made a very good point about. Um, I think it's, for me, the key thing is why is the hypocrisy sticking to Gove, the issue, and not to Johnson? And that gets to what Phil is saying about these kind of problem with wild claims and unsubstantiated claims. And while what Quasi is saying is it's very appealing to have a sort of Boris figure come in and say we're going to do this and this, but that is at the level of rhetoric. And I think that there's a cult around Boris, which is, it's, I mean, in, in many ways it's a sort of very kind of masculine cult, the kind of fun, good time guy who maybe took some drugs, but that's all part of his fun image, throwing out wild claims that kind of sound great. But I think the real issue here, as with all of these candidates, is integrity. Where is the integrity? Sure. That's what we should be asking ourselves. Is there any integrity? And that includes intellectual integrity. Where I disagree with you a bit is that I think that the public is intensely interested in issues of policy, and that's why the drug stuff with Michael Gove is sticking, is that it's not really about him and his, and in, as an individual. It's looking at the disconnect between the policy someone introduces and that, what their own behaviour is. But the focus is very much, I think, on those policies. And when it comes to things like the um, tax breaks, mm. which Boris Johnson has just floated, and there's um, an intense backlash. And it's not just coming from, you know, what's known as the hard left. You've got people in the Conservative oh, Party Morgan. saying this is a terrible idea. And I think that shows that there is an appetite to get into the real substance of political issues. The problem is, is that Brexit isn't just playing out as a bit of a culture, it's playing out as a clash of personalities. And most people in this country are really turned off by it. And the base, the fundamental fact of politics now <clears throat> is not the personalities of those involved. It's the fact that we have a hung parliament. So it's therefore very, very difficult to do anything irrespective. And that's the problem that Boris Johnson confronts. I understand he won't seek an extension. He won't. That much is clear. And that was no, what no, made I, I, it I, but, but therefore it follows then 
that the mechanism by which Parliament will try to stop him will be to lay a vote of no confidence in his government. And now that we know he won't seek that extension, that vote of no confidence can come quite early. And if it happens and he doesn't rule out not taking us out with no deal, he will lose the vote of confidence. And that is the practical question he needs to address. Can I come back to that? Yes. So you've made a prediction. Uh, and I'm questioning your prediction. And the reason why I referred to your earlier prediction, which was completely wrong, was that you have made predictions about... Right, but you've said that. But you've said that. Have. Let's as not repeat that. No, I'd rather, pick, no, is... I'd rather go on to the substance, actually, yeah, because so substance... You've, made, you've made that point. So because, I actually, think... where, no, where a hung parliament may also prove very difficult for Boris Johnson isn't just on the issue sure. of Brexit and pursuing a no-deal Brexit. It might be on the tax cuts that Ash has sure. just mentioned in terms of the, the latest policy, a tax cuts for high earners. How will you get that through parliament? Andrea Leadsom has said today, a rival candidate... There's no way you'll get those tax plans so through Parliament. So it's always been a policy, well, certainly the last three or four years, to have to look at this issue of fiscal drag, which means that people on certain income get caught in a higher tax bracket. Sure, because but this is tax frozen. cuts for high earners. So, is that where you so, should be right so now? So the, the actual policy, which he didn't actually specify the numbers in the article he wrote, the actual policy is about this fiscal drag point. I thought it was, it was the, raising the 40% the, tax rate threshold to £80,000. Yeah, he didn't pounds. write that in the article. That so was, is that not that the policy? Where, I, don't know, I don't know where the numbers came from. I read the article. Right. And the numbers went the in the article. So the point, the, what he mentioned in the article was that fiscal drag is a problem. When the 40% rate was introduced in uh, the early 90s, late 80s, only 1.8 million people paid it. Now right. it's 4.3. So lots of people who were not designed, who were not expected to pay the top rate, have been dragged I, into the top I rate. I think we all understand and, the principle of well, fiscal drag, but the point is, would he get that sort of policy through a hung well, parliament? A, if it's estimated to cost almost £10 billion, pounds, and you do admit it would uh, I benefit... Think we can get uh, you... I mean, I was a PPS, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. We had two budgets. We got two budgets through uh, the hung parliament, and some of them had the, the sorts of policies that Boris is suggesting. I mean, we, this got, is... we got those votes through. This is a pitch, many people say, to better off Tory voters. It's talking to the Tory electorate. Is it something that would be popular? Would it get through Parliament? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I doubt it will get through Parliament if enough people are saying not. But if they manage to hold together the DUP and the government, it, it may do. Uh, but I think that is the central question, whether it would or not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd be opposed to it to myself, but if you were Prime Minister, I'd have a perfectly right to bring that to Parliament and it might get through. But whereas I still think the things which are more pertinent are the bigger question of whether it's possible for Britain to leave the European Union without a deal, without that precipitating a vote of no confidence in a government which would then lose it. So I, I think, think that, if, unless there's an answer to that, I don't think anything but else But I have a different view from you. I don't think that there's any appetite in the House of Commons for a general election this year. Um, I read all the commentary that says there'll definitely be a general election if Boris comes. Well, there isn't appetite for it amongst it. Tory MPs. All the, well, even Labour MPs. I mean, the idea that Labour think that they're going to, uh, you know, romp home, I think, is questionable. A lot of Labour MPs I've spoken to are very worried about uh, a general election. Because that is a clear answer. So your clear answer then is that you don't think they will, in fact, press it to a vote. Of I no think it's confidence. unlikely. No, there may well be a vote of no confidence, but I think it's unlikely. Uh, that there will be a general election this year. Is it sensible, so by the way, to be threatening to withhold the money that would be part of the divorce agreement that has been agreed but not obviously supported by Parliament? So I think it's absolutely sensible, and for this reason. When we went into the dis this discussion, I was talking to American bankers, and they didn't, they didn't understand our position. They said, hang on a sec, you've got the money, so why can't you use that to, to get a deal? And, and I think we took a very... But that's because the EU says they won't move on to well, the next no, stage until the divorce settlement's paid and we well, have... Well, there were, two, there were two aspects to it. There was the, um, the ongoing uh, budget payment, which was roughly about 20 billion, that's 10 net a year. And then there was this other 19, roughly 20 billion, which refers to ongoing liabilities. And I think in a discussion, in a, a discussion about leaving the EU, that should have been on the table, and that's exactly where Boris is. Do you think that that is credible, a credible position to take, or again, is this just red meat to Tory voters, or Tory members, I should say? Um, I think everyone's taking a range of positions, and it'll be interesting to see what actually ends up being, what we look back on as being actually, kind of having this, the air of reality about it. I think that we just need to... I mean, I, I, I'm, I represent a large number of, of people who actually find themselves feeling kind of completely dizzy and at sea with all the back and forth and all the different um, sort of like pronouncements of what, about what will work, what must work, what can work. And I think that the only thing that we can stick to is that we just don't, I personally, I don't know. I think I, I, I'm actually, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't know. I don't know what will, what will work. I don't know what should work. Um, I think we need to get on with it. I don't, you know, I think this, it does seem like it's, a, it's a, you know, Brexit is all about impossibles and it's, it's completely unclear. 
what the path forwards is. I don't know. I, I would be the last person I mean, to offer. Is it just me that was excited about the tax conversation? I was quite excited by the tax conversation. And the reason why I was excited by the tax it conversation... Was, it was just you. Is that, um, <laughs> I was excited by we, it. We all need a hobby. Um, is because I think that what Boris Johnson has showed is that he's pitching to a very socially and economically conservative electorate, which has changed a great deal. So of the 2017 Tory voters, 53% of them are in favour of higher taxation to fund the NHS. So all of these um, policy ideas which are trying to play to the gallery, it might not even work. And one of the things that we miss in these conversations, which are broadly forms of like, you know, public displays of Westminster onanism is that public appetite has increased for increased public spending. Right, well I hope you're pleased we've ended that then on your comments on really taxation, pleased. but actually not quite. I just want to clarify, is Boris Johnson going to take part in a broadcast debate before it gets down to the last two? I don't know. I suspect, I suspect he will focus on the stage that we're at, which is winning amongst the MPs. That's what this game at the moment is about. And he needs to persuade colleagues, and then we can have a wider and very entertaining and engaging debate in the country about policies, about tax policy, about... So he caring. will expect to go to Conservative members in the country without having said anything publicly in a broadcast so interview. One of the other things he does is that he has a column. Yeah, he, I mean, we know. He's written 50 articles, I think, in the last year, which have all sorts of policies, all sorts of uh, political positions. It's not quite adopted. the same, though, is it, as being and, put under and, the spotlight? And uh, there'll be ample opportunity to do that. If and when he gets and to the last stage. Cross, if he's made any single predictions in any of those columns, he will then, oh, I will, I will, will then renounce your... But, but he hasn't made for... specific comments about what will happen in Parliament. Very I mean, you and others do all the time, and I'm afraid your track record... Well, very impressive let's not get back to that. So there could be a case of having all the other candidates, obviously, yeah. being um, under the spotlight, but not with Boris Johnson there. I think Boris is focused on the, the job at hand, and the job at the hand at the moment whether we like it or not, is to try and get the sufficient MPs. So it would be a bit like Theresa May in the general election MPs, then. Not at all, because in Theresa well. May's uh, case, uh, there wasn't even a contest for the leadership. I think Boris has shown uh, in London mayoralty contests, also in the referendum, that he's not afraid of engaging in the spotlight and making his case in a very public right. forum.